if you will, open your Bibles to that which is probably the most familiar of all uh, Bible passages, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. We're going to read through verse 21 in just a moment. Uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, and verse uh, 16. It's uh, very rare that I change my plans in terms of what I'm going uh, to preach. Uh, either I'm preaching consecutively uh, through books and follow that pretty strictly, uh, or either I'm in the midst of a series such as we've been for the last several weeks uh, uh, on the family. And so uh, even uh, as I was preparing this week and had really done about half of the work uh, to be prepared for the continuation of our family series, uh, I began to think that maybe I needed to say a word about uh, this particular moment that we uh, find ourselves in, uh, the challenges and uh, the difficulties uh, that are, are right here present with us uh, when this uh, COVID crisis came upon us. Uh, I felt uh, very uh, inadequate uh, to speak to the issue in that I'm not a scientist nor a medical professional, so I really don't understand uh, how a virus works. And then as the government attempted to uh, respond, I, I'm not an economist, uh, so I don't really understand everything involved uh, with how an economy functions, only at, at the most fundamental and simple uh, levels, uh, but I, I think uh, there's been an abundance of missteps at every level in dealing with the COVID crisis. And then we come to what is pressing upon us on the heels, and I don't think it's unrelated to the COVID crisis personally, but on the heels of this uh, are uh, once again uh, the issues of, of racial uh, prejudice and uh, that, that has been flamed uh, into a, a, a fire with, with again, just the, the senseless death uh, of an African-American man in Minneapolis. And then again, it seems to, uh, to be repeated as we continue uh, to go forward. And there's no excuse, there's no reason for this type thing other than the realities of a, a fallen world, of sinful men. And so... While I, am so, while I am so skeptical of the way the, the government or the way various social uh, agencies attempt to address a problem, they tend to not ask the fundamental question and they never get to the core of the issue. It has been difficult to treat people with the COVID virus because it's, it's unique and it changes and it's different and the symptomology changes and so forth. So how do we address the issue uh, related to race relations within a culture? We, we tend to put band-aids on things and we tend to, 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 put, to have stopgap measures, but we never address it as it is. It's a sin problem. It's a sin problem within each human being and then within the culture, the way sin actually works within uh, social institutions and agencies, whether they're the government itself or whether things like media and education, sin becomes ingrained and it become, and it repeats itself over and over again. And so I believe God word, God's Word speaks to this issue and teaches us how to address these things. And while government... It's a good thing. It's been instituted by, by God, and I, I applaud uh, a, a good government. But at the end of the day, because they apply godless measures, they come up with godless answers, and, and so they're never going to remedy the human situation. It is the church that possesses uh, the, the answer for reconciliation, for peace, for hope within different people groups that populate a nation that inform a society. So let's, let's look at this, first of all, from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, and let's think about God's 
love for fallen humanity, God's love expressed in a broken world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in Him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light. So it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Pray with me if you will. Father, once again, we thank you for your truth, for your light in a dark world, a light that still shines brightly, a truth that is still true, a power that still transforms. Help us to hear and apply your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, in this most well-known of Bible passages, we are told, and these are Jesus' own words, of the Father's love for the world, a love that, that motivated Him to send the Son on a great ministry, a great work of reconciliation to, uh, to accomplish and therefore extend through the proclamation of that accomplishment salvation to any and all who would believe that Jesus in His incarnation did not come for the purpose of judgment, of, of condemnation. And let me pause right there and be sure we understand this rightly. There is a time when Jesus will come. He will be here in bodily form and it will be for the purpose of settling all accounts. It will be for the po po purpose of judgment. It will be for the purpose of condemning all who have rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. But He did not come to accomplish that condemnation. He came to live and to die, to suffer at the hands of wicked men, to suffer the wrath of God for their salvation. And as this gospel has, has been proclaimed throughout the centuries, we have found over and over and over again that the, in the darkness of our world, there will always be those that love their darkness, that refuse to come to the light because first of all the light hurts not only our eyes it hurts our hearts as sin is exposed it is a painful thing for the light of God's truth to expose the wickedness of our hearts but that wickedness must ultimately be exposed if we're to know the gospel of God's grace if we're to know the power of God's grace the forgiveness of God's grace if we're to know that which Jesus died on the cross to accomplish and so as we think about this there is a reality of a dark world of a sinful world of a world populated by fallen image bearers and so let's speak just to that for just a moment as we think about this necessity of uh, the love of God that that we have learned that that all of humanity comes from Adam there is a a, a common starting point for all of humanity. There is a connection between every person that bears the image of God. Paul proclaims this at Mars Hill. That from one man, all the people that populate the earth, they have descended. And so there is a commonality among man. There is also distinctives among human beings of, of varying types. But at our core, we're unique creations. But we have become incredibly flawed because of the entrance of human sin. Paul says that we have all sinned. We trace that all the way back to our first parents, Adam. That we are indeed image bearers. But we have been marred and flawed and broken by sin. And one of those sins is hatred toward fellow image bearers. It's in the fourth chapter of the Bible. We find the record of the first murder. Why did Cain murder Abel? Because his deeds had been exposed because he resented that because his own heart was evil and dark and he murdered his own brother. 
And so you deceive yourself if you do not think that evil still resides, it still lurks in the human heart. Even for those that have been redeemed and reconciled by the grace of God, the remnants of that old Adamic nature remain. And we want to pretend sometimes, well, I'm not prejudiced. That is simply, I think, be akin to say, I don't lust, and I'm not greedy, and I don't get bitter, and I don't get angry. It is just a part of the reality of our own sinfulness. To be sure, some are less prejudiced regarding race than others. Some are less bitter than others. Some are less angry than others. Some are less lustful than others. But all of it comes from the core of sin. And because of that, we we look at people that are different from us, or we think they're different from us. Remember, there's the common reality of where we came from and the common experience of our sinfulness but we want to look at them and treat them differently and that is that is wrong that that is sin and 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 Christ entered our world to remedy that condition and so we find ourselves at a a point in in history that that the the blindness of the human heart seems to be accentuated and we see that in scripture it, why, why we act like we're shocked that we are where we are. It is objectively true that it is wrong to discriminate against a human being on the basis of their race. That is a, a sin. Now, how does that sin keep rearing up its head in our culture? Because we have rejected the notion of objective truth. If we can say that it is good, it is right to kill a baby in the womb, then we can disrespect, we can discriminate against an image bearer of a darker skin pigmentation. If we can say that all forms of sexual perversion are fine and should be celebrated and defended, then we have divorced ourselves from that which is objectively true. How is it that we can recover the objective truth that all image bearers are worthy of the dignity of their fellow image bearers? Do you see the connection? And if we don't understand that this flows from sin and it's systemic, it's personal, but it's also systemic. And what it, since we have divorced ourselves from truth, let's go to Romans chapter 1. For the 935th time since I've been pastor of this church, but you know what? It always applies. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. We're under the wrath of God. Okay? The world is under the wrath of God. That, that, that we see evil because God is letting evil run its course. And we're, it's, we're, the world is populated by people that suppress the truth. How? How in God's name can an individual in, entrusted with authority to keep the peace kneel upon a fellow image bearer and hold him down until he can't breathe and he dies. That individual has suppressed the truth of the dignity of that fellow image bearer. How is that possible? But we're in that time, we're at that place in the culture. And so here's what's happening. Look down to verse 28. This describes our culture. We do not see fit to acknowledge God. Now let me say this, please. I do not believe that all of the framers of our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were born again Christians, okay? But for the most part, it, there were many, okay? But it would seem at least there was some acknowledgement of the reality of God and some respect for the revelation of of God given to men in the Bible and in the gospel. Now, were they flawed? Let me tell you something. Those that claimed to be born again, they owned slaves. They were messed up people, okay? I'm not defending that everything they did was right. We have been a flawed people since Adam sinned, okay? But there was some concept of that which was right and true and wrong. And eventually... We began to see the truth. I mean, Thomas Jefferson penned in the Declaration of Independence, 
All men are created equal. What in the world did he mean? He owned slaves. How do you write that? When you take a fellow image bearer and you hold him against his will and force him to work. So I'm saying it, it, there, there are flaws all along the way. But we came to understand the era of that particular writing. That, that men are before God created equal. Now, even that can be misunderstood. Even that can be misunderstood. Because there are differences in people. Now, y'all probably don't believe this, but there are people here that are smarter than me. Well, that ain't fair. That ain't, there, there are people here that are taller than me. I don't like that either. I mean, there are distinctions and differences among people. What we mean is before the eyes of the law and before the eyes of God, there is an equality because we bear his image. But, but again, we have divorced ourselves from objective truth. So once we've cut ourselves loose from that anchor, from that foundation, then, then things go wherever they want to do. And here's what God has done. Have it your way. Look at the next phrase. Look at the next phrase there in verse 28. God gave them up. God gave them up. Now, what happens when God gives them up to this de debased mind? Notice what they do. To do what ought not to be done. Yeah. Increasingly. We do what ought not to be done. And so, look at verse 29. Unrighteousness, evil, covetousness. Now let me tell you something. For someone of a, a darker skin, and, 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 and kind of a funny thing happened yesterday. Ellen and I had been out on a little field trip, and we are riding back. My arm was kind of against hers. She was kind of laughing that my skin is much darker than hers. Now, I've never been one that had the dark complexion. Joey's got kind of the olive complexion, but much darker than, than mine. I'm kind of fair-skinned, actually. Uh, and I, I quoted one of the great Americans of our time, Charles Barkley, when he said of Larry Bird, you ain't white, you're clear. And I told Ellen, I said, you ain't white, you're clear, girl, because I ain't that dark. But who's to say that I'm too dark to be treated like a white person? Where, where's the line? I mean, just, and, and, and what I'm, but, 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 so, so it's wrong to treat people unjustly because of the color of their sin, of, the, of, their, of their skin. But it's also wrong to act out as a result of that by destroying the property of others. When you kill somebody or when you mistreat them, you're disrespecting, you're, you're refusing to give to them the d dignity of being an image bearer demands. But let me tell you something. Now, I'm not going to say that stealing your stuff or burning your house down or destroying your property is as bad as killing you. But what are you doing? You're taking the dignity of of an individual when you take property and destroy that which does not belong to you you're only that that far when you do something like it you're only that far from killing them you're only that far from killing them you are ultimately disrespecting a person who bears the image of God so I don't I don't say I don't get some of this now to when there's a great injustice and we cry out We've been crying out for 50 plus years now that those conceived in the womb of a woman deserve to be defended and we stand in the streets and we shout that they deserve justice. Right? Okay. And so if people want to go to the streets and say this was unjust, this murder and other things that happened in the culture and, and, and say, listen, stand up and pay attention that prejudice is not dead because it's a sin. It resides deeply in the human heart and it will work its way out so very inconveniently and all too frequently. Then so be it. But when it deserves devolves into chaos and the desire to, to, to have anarchy, then you, you haven't solved anything. You're, you're, you're simply destroying whatever framework there is to build upon. And so we find ourselves in this condition, and this, this is why I want you to turn, I want you to see it, because you'll know where 
you'll know the time that we're in. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul is speaking to these Thessalonians Christians and I don't know, maybe they got so discouraged they were given that little whiny, I'm just sitting around here waiting on the rapture. Just get me out of here, Jesus. Beam me up. And maybe he thought I need to straighten these folks out about that. Let me tell you something. Quit whining. Quit whining. We're the people of power and truth. We have the truth. If there's any hope, and there is, it's in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're the people who possess that. And let me tell you this. As much as I, listen, we just had D-Day yesterday, and I think about the brave men that have defended this nation, and I think it's the greatest nation that ever lived. But again, the government's not going to fix our problem. The government's not, they don't, listen, they're, pardon me, but it's, I think the COVID thing is, is terrible and it's scary and all of that, but I think the $6 trillion they, they're going to throw down the rabbit hole is probably worse than the disease itself. It's going to cause more problem in the years ahead because it's, they're going to keep throwing money at it. Okay? The government's not going to fix it. What did Ronald Reagan say? The, sc the scariest words in the world is somebody knocking on your door and say, Hello, I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. And yet the church, we have sat back. And here's the thing. Going all the way back to the 50s and 60s. And I, I would encourage you to go to the Birmingham Civil Rights Museum. You need to walk through that. You need to do that. You really do. But Martin Luther King, a flawed image bearer to be sure, but a man who spoke truth in a certain way, and how in the world could the Christian people of Birmingham, Alabama sit quietly by and allow the ways to the injustice that was being perpetuated on the black community here at that time? I mean, the church is flawed too. We, we haven't got this right yet. At least in practice. At least in practice. We say what? Racial prejudice is a sin, and it is. But again, what, what are we doing to address it? Martin Luther King once wrote that uh, the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday mornings, most segregated hour in the United States of America, it hadn't changed much. It really hasn't changed much. Uh, our communities are increasingly diverse, and our churches aren't. I don't, I don't understand that exactly. But there's a lot of things I don't understand. But let's look at this. What's going on? Well, we've divorced ourselves from the anchor of truth. We've denied the realities of God and His uh, revelation in Jesus Christ. And so these people in Thessalonica thought the day of the Lord was at hand, the day of God's final judgment. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Not until the man of lawlessness appears okay that's that's a day that's coming now now understand that 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 that's the antichrist the spirit of the antichrist has been working since all the way back to noah's day or before even i guess even in cain okay so that spirit's always been present okay but there's going to be a final and ultimate antichrist but all of, all of his shenanigans are being restrained look at verse 6 and you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in the last time. In other words, the Antichrist would have popped up and carried out his work a long time ago, except there's a restraint on him until the appropriate time. But, verse 7, the mystery of lawlessness. Now what are we seeing? We're seeing lawlessness within the culture. Okay? What, what, what is accomplished in the name of justice if I throw a rock through your store window and I walk in and take your television or your jewelry or your whatever and I walk out with it? How, how do, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I get people being frustrated, but that, that doesn't, doesn't wash out. And so... The mystery of lawlessness is at work. And, and there's people, even within, even within the government, that are calling for lawlessness. 
I, I hear, I couldn't believe it. I, and sometimes I just, I can't handle any more television news. I just get to that place. I just, I just can't handle it. I just, I, I just, ugh. I just, and, and so, but, but, but evidently there are people saying, let's, let's disband and defund police departments. They don't understand the fundamental problem of living in a fallen world. You better have somebody that can't, has the authority to enforce the law. Or evil will run rampant. And then you have what happened in the book of Judges. In those days, Israel has no king. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Oh my gracious. I, I, but, but again, lawlessness is already at work. We see that. And then there's a day only he who now restrains will do it until he's taken out of the way. So what I think is going on, even in the world and certainly in our culture, as we have suppressed the knowledge of the truth, we've divorced ourselves from God, from that anchor in, in truth, then God is saying, okay, I'm going to remove the restraint. I'm going to remove. Uh, I'm going to remove the presence of the one who restrains evil. I believe the Holy Spirit operates even upon the unbeliever to keep them from acting out in such as evil as they possibly could. And so that is being restrained. I mean that that is being removed. And so this we have this principle of lawlessness that is taking place and causing the the culture to be increasingly evil that that all of the institutions whether they're business or government or or education are being utilized to accomplish evil and so that's a very dangerous thing so we're at a time where what Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24 as it was in the days of Noah well what was what was it like in the days of Noah the infections of the man of a man's heart was on evil constantly they were given over to evil and so that seems to be the trajectory we're on now you say well that's well, God, what do we do well, again I, I've ran across a number of people that have said you know I tested positive for the COVID uh, antibody met, met, met several people I said well and some of them say, you know, I, I was pretty sick back in January or something like that, February. You know, the doctor couldn't tell me what was wrong with me. And it finally kind of ran its course. And then I had something done the other day, and they said, I've got the antibody. And so, you know, I'm sure you've heard people say that. Because it's, 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 it was evidently difficult to, to diagnose. And here's the problem in our culture. We're not diagnosing the problem sufficiently and accurately. We're not calling the problem sin. We're not calling people to repentance. We're not bringing to bear the light of the gospel upon this abomination against image bearers. And so as long as we don't know what the problem is, we're going to keep treating these symptoms and they're being treated by people that think it's right to kill unborn babies. They think it's right to celebrate sexual perversion. How in the world are they going to get it right as to how we should live and work together as image bearers of Almighty God? They cannot get it right. They're not going to get it right. Apart from the gospel. And they, as I said, you know, it depends on your eschatology. And I, I, you know, I want to be a post-mill guy. And I want, I want y'all to be post-mill guys so y'all be happy, okay? So I'm kind of a pre-mill guy and that's, that's kind of a, a negative outlook on, on kind of the way the world's going to wrap up. I but, you know, I'm for post-millennialism. I'm for the gospel just so transforming society that, that, that it, is, it is prepared for the return of its king and it celebrates the return of its king, okay? I like that. I like that. And we should, we should live like that. But I don't know if everybody is going to be saved and it doesn't seem like that's going to be the case. But you know what? As people are saved, they have a way, they have a preserving effect upon the society. Why, why, do, why do I insist that abortion be illegal? Because it's good for my fellow image bearer. 
it's a good thing for human flourishing. Why do I not think that, that homosexuals ought to be ma married? That, that, that there ought to be some kind of defense of that? Because it's bad for human flourishing. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Gospel-informed policy-making is good for the human condition. As much as we want them to be saved. Okay, maybe they will. Maybe the, I hope the post mills are right. That, that, it, that, that, that society is going to be so transformed. But let me tell you this. Whatever your view is doesn't mean Clay, Alabama can't be so transformed that it would be a light in an ever-darkening world. And that's my area of responsibility. So, all right, we got to, I got to move quickly. I did the same thing I did in the first service. I got kind of bogged down. God has taken the initiative. We, we watched this, this documentary last night on Corey Ten Boom. If you don't know who she is, you need to Google her. Uh, but uh, and there's actually a movie that came out in the 70s called The Hiding Place about her life. But how this dear lady, betrayed by her own countrymen and brutalized by, by the Nazis, could come to a place of forgiveness. And she came to understand that, that God sent his son into the world knowing that he would be brutalized. And she was able in her, in her thought processes to forgive the man who betrayed her so that she and her family would be arrested and her father and her brother would die, and, and sister, die in custody. Okay, She was able to forgive on the basis of of the gospel so God has taken the initiative to send into the world so, so uh, to send his son to be brutalized so he can forgive us and as we think about that we need to think about what it means to forgive one another that the son has accomplished our salvation and we need to recognize folks if you look at 2C there and I'm not going to have time to unpack all of that simply this that the Son of God's work in our world, His, His work on the cross, was that for people from many nations, people of different ethnic uh, groups, would come to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved and populate the kingdom of God. And that is the glorious vision that John sees before the throne described in four, uh, Revelation 4.9. What does he see? People from every tribe, tongue, and nation ransomed by the blood of the Lamb. So whatever we can do to make the church look like Revelation 4 and 9, that's what we do. We preach the gospel. We call sin, sin. Nobody is saved by smoozing over sin. By denying what sin is. We need to call it what it is. And so we live in the hope and the power of God's love, that God has forgiven us. Again, Corey Tim Boom talked about how she could forgive as she, she thought about what Jesus Christ suffered on the cross for her. And while she suffered greatly in concentration camps, and she, she, she didn't see her sister die because she was taken away, but she was at the point of death, and she knew that she died in that Nazi concentration camp. And that guard who brutalized his sister, her, her sister, came to her and asked for her forgiveness. And her heart was filled with anger and indignation and bitterness toward that guard. And she prayed for God to do what? To work his love in her. In fact, you see it here back in our John 3 text. That... Verse 21, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. How did Corey Tim Boone forgive those people? She didn't forgive it in her own strength. She forgave it in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ for, God, for the glory of God. And so we, we have the hope of the power of the gospel changing our heart. I, I wouldn't go so far to say that everyone is born a racist. We're born sinners. And racism seems to be one of those common things. As I say, I've never met a man that didn't struggle with lust. There may be one out there, but I've never known of one. Uh, I've, I've never known anybody that didn't at some level. They may not admit it, 
but doesn't struggle with coveting and greediness. I think that's, that's pretty much a standard American sin. And I think, I think racism is like that. I really do. Now, we may cover it up real well. We may not act out on it. But it is easy to look at people that are different than us and demean them. And it's hard for us, as I said, I, I feel so unqualified in that I have not lived as a minority citizen in a country. I, I don't, so I don't, I've never experienced what, what they have experienced, the slights. Because what, it, what I said about sin and it being personal, it, it's, it also becomes ingrained. If, if, if you are the majority population, there is a way that that majority sin becomes ingrained in every system. That's why you had the things that you had in the United States of America all through the 20th century. All the, the, the actions, the, the, the segregation and, and so forth and, and so on. The Jim Crow laws and the like. And, but, and as I said, the, 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 the conservative evangelical church was lar- largely, not only were they not, they weren't silent, they were working against the justice in the culture. And that's, that's a tragic black eye, I think, for the church I think it's a tragic black eye and so we need to understand what it means to be reconciled and to understand that there have been slots because that is the nature of culture there are ingrained attitudes that oppress okay and so we need to be sensitive to that we need to recognize that and we need to change In that documentary last night, and I've, I've found myself at this place, Corey Tim Boom said, look around and be distressed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I have just kind of in these last few months even, are there any desert islands for sale that I can buy and move on to? And just leave it. Now, what's the problem with that? Number one, it would be sin to drop out of the culture. The Bible never instructs us to drop out. And number two, I'm the problem. I'm going with me. So I can't get away from the sin problem. Sin's always an eye problem. Right? But look around and be distracted. I have been just dismayed at, at, at everything. Okay? And then... You look within, and you know what I am? I'm, dis- I'm depressed because I look at how sinful I am. I've been walking this walk for nearly 50 years. I'm your pastor, for goodness sake. I tell people all the time, I told somebody yesterday, they said, yeah, they pay me to be nice. Probably need to pay me more. I might be nicer. I don't know if it works like that or not. But yeah. But I mean, I, I look in me and I, I realize how flawed I am. And then she finishes, look at Jesus and be at rest. Now, look, folks, I don't have the answer other than this. Whatever these godless, stripped of the witness of God, structures we have in society are, whatever answer they come up with will not work. We may put a band-aid on it for a while, but it will not ultimately work. And I understand that, that, that society is not going to work properly until King Jesus comes and rules and reigns. I, I, I get that. But we want to strive for a gospel-influenced culture. Okay? We want to strive for that because, again, as long as the world doesn't call all of these things sin. They, they just don't want to. And, and it, 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 again, you got to put the whole thing together. I mean, I've mentioned a minute ago. A culture that celebrates murdering babies and defends that. And, 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 and as some people call it, it is the central sacrament of, of the left wing of our United States now. That that must de- be defended at all costs. And then this whole uh, sexual perversion agenda. 
it, it, so, so if you're that divorced from truth, and you're going to teach people how to live together as image bearers of God, you're going to get that one right. You, you're completely flawed in that view, in those things. But you're going to get that, no, I don't think so. And that's why we need, as the church, we need to be a people of the truth. And, it, and it's this idea that, that we need to destroy the America we know and rebuild it and, 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 and kind of this socialist ideology. It's one of the most godless things I've ever heard of. It will not work. It will not que- create a just society. It will not, it will not eradicate uh, racial prejudice. It will increase it. It will make it worse. That, again, these, these godless answers do more to aggravate the problem than they do to solve the problem. And so we need to be a people. We need to recognize sin for what it is and where it is and be sure that we are a part of what God would do to to solve, to reconcile, to restrain evil. It's a good thing for evil to be restrained within a society. And as we live not with a sense of hopelessness, but with a sense of, of great hope that God would work, that God would preserve, that God would convert for His glory and also for our own good because we seem as a culture to be hell-bent on destroying ourselves. That's what people who suppress the truth do. We destroy ourselves. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. Uh, For the reality of your power and presence, would you work? Use your word. Would you display your power and glory? Would you change us so that we would be a people of the light? That we would indeed be salt. That would preserve a world that is decaying, that is fraying, that seems so hell-bent on destroying itself, Lord. May we know the answer. May we proclaim your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.